As part of its resolve to give back to the society, Prince Ivano Supermarkets, one of the fastest growing chain of supermarkets in Nigeria, has completed and commissioned the extensive rebuilding and modernization of the Waifu Primary School in Agboika, South Local Government Area of Delta State. Established in 1955, Waifu Primary School is one of the many projects embarked on by Prince Ebiano uh, in uh, order to improve the quality of education in the country. The challenges in the educational sector are enormous, especially in the area of ensuring a conducive teaching and learning environment, provision of well-equipped classrooms and other infrastructure. In comes private sector player Prince Ebaino Supermarkets, determined to assist government for the good of the Nigerian child. The organization has done renovation and reconstruction projects, and Waifa Primary School in Iwuru, Agbo Delta State, is the latest beneficiary. The Delta State Governor, Ifaini Okoa, represented by the Secretary to the State Government, Festus Agus, and the Commissioner for Basic Education, Chiedu Ebie, are here to formally commission the project. The new Uwaifo Primary School comes with a library complex, two units of 10 KVA solar power panels, renovated classrooms, teacher's staff room, ICT laboratory, amongst other facilities. This project here is extraordinary. I want to therefore use the opportunity to commend the donor, Prince Ebano, and the supermarket group for partnering with the Delta State Government. Maintenance is key as well. If not, if you, if you don't have a strong maintenance policy in place, you come back here in a couple of months and it will be run down. The donor, Prince Ebaino and company, speak on the plans for more projects which will be beneficial to the public. The same way we did the secondary school project years back, they looked forward and we came to the point where we are now. And so looking forward, you will see other things. And prior to that one or to this one, like I said, is the hospital project in Lagos. So the fact remains that at every point in time, the organization has plans to keep doing things to benefit the populace. I'm very happy about this school. And may God bless the man who built it and his family. Education, they say, is the life force of every nation. Projects like this should be encouraged to ensure the right of every Nigerian child to free, basic and universal education. An 11-year-old boy who had his vision corrected following a cataract removal surgery is one of many Nigerians with vision problems who have benefited from the 2019 edition of the Saplat Petroleum Development Company, PLC, I Can See program, a corporate social responsibility project the company started in 2012. At a concluding session of the 2019 event held at the palace grounds of the Benin Monarch in Benin City, the Edo State Capital, Saplat Operations Director said that the company considers the exercise impactful and plans to continue the program. Statistics from the World Health Organization indicates that approximately 1.3 billion people live with some form of distance or near vision impairment globally, with approximately 80% considered avoidable. In Nigeria, Saplat Petroleum Development Company PLC has adopted since 2012 the I Can See program to address cases of vision impairment in communities where it operates. Its 2019 edition has brought these Nigerians with various vision problems to the grounds of the Palace of the Benin Monarch in the Edo State capital, Benin City, where they receive care. Genesis is 11 years old. He's in primary four. He had cataracts in both eyes. The Saplet I Can See program handles the surgery to correct his vision. His mother cannot hide her emotions or gratitude. That's on Tuesday, they operate one eye of Genesis. So God be the glory, as they lose the eye, Genesis now see where. They do the second one, and they lose it today. We see clearly. 
the company believes the program has been impactful. Just imagine you really can't see, and then you come through this program and now you can see. Imagine what sight has in terms of impact on people's life. It's amazing. So that's what's really inspiring us to keep investing, and, and, and we will continue to do this on a very, very long term. Almost close to 70,000 patients have been screened, and within that number, we've given glasses to 28,600 patients have received eyeglasses. And again, when we add the figures of 2019, we're definitely going to have over 30,000 people receiving eyeglasses. In terms of operation, we have done 2,850 operations, and again, 2019 added to it to be over 3,000. The representative of the Benin Monakuma Nobane Dukwa Polopolo NY the second at the event considers the exercise impressive. We well, are highly impressed and uh, we pray uh, that uh, CEPLAT will continue to work stronger and stronger. CEPLAT maintains it's passionate about seeing that the communities receive the benefits of the program and plans to continue touching lives. You're watching the news at 10 on channels television. Let's shift our gears again to business news with Anne Waudo. You first. First Bank. Thank you, Gimba. Welcome to the world of business. We begin with the International Monetary Fund saying that it expects more recovery for sub-Saharan African economies this year. The IMF's Deputy Director, African Department, Abera Lassi, made this known at the launch of the Regional Outlook at the ongoing spring meeting of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund in Washington, D.C. He, however, explains that some economies within the region will face sluggish growth in the near term. Financial services giant FBN Holdings has released its full-year scorecard for the year 2018. It shows a resilient performance in contrast to the previous year. The latest earnings result shows that the group's pre-tax profit jumped by 19.6% to 65.3 billion naira, while the after-tax profit surged by 31.4% to 59.7 billion naira year on year. However, the group's gross earnings slipped by 2% to 583.5 billion naira, and that's down from the 595.5 billion which was posted in 2017, while the earnings per share increased by 43.4% to 1 Naira 65 Kobo. In the meantime, the company's board has announced a 26 Kobo dividend for its shareholders. United States energy giant Chevron Corporation has announced plans to acquire an Adarco Petroleum Corporation in a cash and stock time worth $33 billion, and that's about $65 a share. The deal, which could be finalized in the second half of this year, if approved by the regulators and the shareholders, will see Chevron issue 0.36 shares with, and $16.25 in cash for each share of Anadarko Petroleum. Chevron Corporation is also looking to increase its stock buyback plan to $5 billion from the previous $4 billion. It says that Anadarko transaction will unlock significant value for shareholders, free cash flow and earnings one year after closure, and it will also boost expected annual run rate of approximately two billion U.S. dollars. It's the third day of recovery for the local stock market. The all share index has ended the second trading week in the month of April in a high margin. Bisi Adebayo has more for us. Hello and welcome to the Stock Market Report. It's a third day of back-to-back -back gains at the Nigerian stock market as the trading week ends today with another increase of 0.73%. The Naira value of all listed securities closed at 11.1 trillion Naira. On the sectoral chart, all the major indices we track were also in the green, except the insurance sector, which declined 2.79%. Sovereign Trust Insurance, CHAMS and Zenith Bank were the most actively traded stocks. At the end of the session, over 232 million shares worth 1.97 billion naira were traded in 2,677 transactions. Well, market watchers expect the positive momentum to continue next week. That's it on the Stock Market Report. I am BC Adebayo.
European and U.S. markets have ended today's trading session mostly higher. Also, economic data, early first quarter results and Brexit have come fears. Let's see how they ended today. And that's business news for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Anne Waldo. Have a wonderful weekend. You first. First Bank. On well, the stories outside of Nigeria now, Sudan's Defense Minister Awad Ibn uh, Awaf has stepped down as the head of the country's transitional military council the day after former President Omar al Bashir was overthrown in a coup. Lieutenant General Abdul Fattah Abdurrahman uh, Burham will be the new head of the Transitional Military Council. Ibn Alf was uh, Bashir's Vice President and Defence Minister and is amongst a handful of Sudanese commanders sanctioned by Washington for his role during the atrocities committed in the Darfur conflict. Sudan's ruling military council had earlier announced on Friday that it would not extradite President Omar al-Bashir to face allegations of genocide at International War Crimes Court. He might instead go on trial in Sudan. Let's now get more stories from the international scene, particularly from Sudan, with Around the World in Five. Protesters have defied an overnight curfew to demand the election of a civilian government. The demonstration comes after the military seized power, overthrowing President Omar al-Bashir after 30 years of rule. But the army says it has no intention of staying in control and is simply acting as a caretaker. Danny Vichenovic reports. It was more festive than forceful, but the thousands of protesters who decided to ignore the military curfew still want their voices to be heard. After three decades under autocratic rule, they don't want to spend the next two years being governed by the army. The military was quick to respond, saying it's there for the people. Its only concern is public order. <laughs> Two years is the maximum, but if it becomes clear to us that within a month Sudan is able to manage things without chaos breaking out, then we are prepared to do this, even if it's just a month. As the country woke to a new dawn, the air was again filled with music. But despite assurances from the army, the demonstrators say the sit-ins will continue until the transition period is over. The U.S. is urging authorities to exercise restraint. We commend the people of Sudan for their resiliency and their commitment to nonviolence as they express their legitimate demand for inclusive and representative government that respects and protects human rights. The deposed president, Omar al-Bashir, is wanted for alleged war crimes. An arrest warrant was issued 15 years ago. The United Nations is calling on Sudan to cooperate with the International Criminal Court. As tanks quietly roll through the streets surveying the mood, the standoff continues. The army says it has no ambition to hold power and plans to relinquish control when a workable solution is presented by the people. Danny Vichenovich, Channels Television News. At least 20 people have been killed in a bomb blast in Pakistan. The device was hidden among bags of potatoes at a market in the southwestern city of Quetta. Dozens of people were also injured in the blast. Half of the victims were ethnic Hazaras who are frequently targeted by militants. Libya's internationally recognized government says it's taken almost 200 prisoners as fighting continues for control of the capital. Officials have accused Khalifa Haftar's Libyan National Army of using teenagers to advance on Tripoli. The United Nations says more than 50 people have been killed and 8,000 forced to flee their homes over the past week. 
WikiLeaks supporters in Ecuador staged a protest outside the foreign ministry after founder Julian Assange's seven-year asylum was revoked. He was forcibly removed from the embassy in London and is now in British custody. The U.S. is seeking his extradition on computer hacking charges. We expect all relevant authorities um, to ensure that Mr. Assange's right to a fair trial is upheld. The U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is on a three-day tour of Latin America. His first stop was the Chilean capital Santiago and he plans to visit Paraguay and Peru. It will be the first time in more than 50 years that a U.S. Secretary of State has visited Paraguay. He'll also travel to Cucuta on the Colombian border where millions of Venezuelan migrants are seeking refuge. The Dalai Lama has been discharged from hospital three days after being admitted with a chest infection. The Tibetan spiritual leader reportedly said he feels almost normal. He is expected to spend a few days resting in Delhi before returning to Dharamsala. And finally, some mixed results when it comes to space exploration. Israel's Beersheet spacecraft has crashed on the moon, shattering the country's hopes of an historic controlled landing on the lunar surface. It suffered a series of technical failures during its final descent. If at first you don't succeed, you try again. Meanwhile, in the U.S., there were celebrations at the most powerful operational rocket in the world. A SpaceX Falcon heavy nailed a triple booster landing for the first time on its return to Earth after a satellite delivery. And that's your international news around the world in five. I am Amarachi Ubani. Still ahead on the news at 10, Super Eagles of Nigeria in the easy group after they are drawn against Guinea, Madagascar and Burundi in the 2019 Africa Cup of Nations. That's the sports news. Stay with us.